Welcome to Race Relations in Canada on Shaw Spotlight. Hi, I'm Paul Wynn, the host of today's show, and we'll have very interesting interviews with George Anderson and Markeel Simpson, both from Vancouver. Yeah, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. Now, maybe maybe Thank I you. could start start with you, uh, Markeel, and uh, ask you. You know, I know that uh, you've involved in a number of community groups and organizations uh, that deal with, uh, you know, sort of racism and uh, discrimination and and probably poverty as well, uh, knowing the neighborhood you're in. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, sure. Well, I come from a, mostly a sports background. Um, I played collegiately or at, U- at the university level and at the international level as well for volleyball. Um, and then I recently joined the BC Community Alliance, which is a non-for-profit dedicated to fighting systemic racism. So that's where I've been um, doing the majority of my advocacy work. Um, but we're part of a team, so where we've been working together. And I'm also um, on the executive of the BC Young New Democrats, which is, oh. a, yeah, it's a subcategory of like the BC NDP. Okay, great. Yeah. And George, how about you? Um, you know, I know that you, you uh, got involved in po- uh, politics very early because I, I think the age of 18, you were elected to the city council in the city of uh, Nanaimo. Maybe you could, from that point, maybe you could tell us more about yourself. Well, thank you for that, Paul. Uh, I, I would say, just to clarify the record, I was actually 20 when I was elected to Nanaimo City Council out of 28 candidates. Uh, I placed 29 votes from third place and also was then appointed to the regional district of Nanaimo board that has 17 members and uh, was chair of transportation during that period of time. And one of the big things for me was ensuring that we had more people involved in the political process. So that meant more young people, people of different backgrounds and so on. And so one of the big things that I uh, championed while I was on council was ensuring that we had those people engaged. So that was using platforms such as social media and other platforms. And we actually ended up winning uh, an award from the inter- the Institute of Public Administrators of Canada, which was the fourth time that a municipality had ever won that award. And that was for an electronic town hall. But my volunteer work goes way back. I was uh, involved with the British Columbia Youth Parliament. I was part of the ADAPT Society, which ended up helping get... Um, uh, young people to have the information with respect to drugs and mental health. I've been involved with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the Nanaimo Ladies Miss Schools Foundation, with respect to ensuring that young people could also get uh, breakfast in the morning, but also have scholarships and bursaries to attend uh, attend university and post secondary. And uh, kindly enough, in 2016. Uh, I was inducted into the BC Achievement Foundation and was given a BC Achievement Award by the Lieutenant Governor at the time, Judith Guichon. Oh, and, and in your spare time, what, what do you uh, do? <laughs> <laughs> in my spare time, I'm a lawyer. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's when you get the rest. Too. Okay, I am. Yes, exactly. Uh, but I love music. I, I'm a cyclist and I sit on a couple of uh, volunteer boards as well. Oh, well, that's... That's great. I mean, I think it's neat that you have the time to be involved in so many things over a period of time. And I was going to ask you, Mark Hill, um, I wanted to uh, get from you in, in the community groups and organizations that you're involved in. Is how much how much is there interaction in uh, with people of color? Um, most of the interaction that we have with people of color is typically with. Um, people coming to us um, to help advocate for them um, or other members of the black community or BIPOC community at large, um, mostly trying to find ways to collaborate on projects and, and uh, advance a shared struggle. But that said, there isn't a lot of communications with people of color from institutions such as the government um, or um, schools or the ministries or anything like that. So. Yeah. Do, you, do you encounter any from the indigenous community? First Nations? Um, I did get the opportunity to meet with a young indigenous gentleman 
uh, just a couple weeks ago, actually, to talk about a project to try and get some young leadership um, going for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and there's a lot of intersections, so we want to continue those conversations. So we're just at the beginning of that. Um, but we're looking forward to having more conversations with folks from the Indigenous community. And, and, and George, I was, you know, since the, um, the, you know, the death of Mr. Forbes, I, I just wonder about Black Lives Matter. You know, that, that sort of lit a fire under race relations in, in a lot of areas. Uh, have you noticed any change or an attitude since that happened in your environment that you, you know, travel in? In my environment right now, it, uh, it seems that there is an appetite amongst people in society that something has to change, that uh, too often we're seeing these type of events. Interestingly, at, in and about the same time of Mr. Floyd's murder, uh, there was the issue with, in Toronto with uh, Regis Korczynski Paquette in Toronto, where the police allegedly had pushed her off, off a balcony. And yet we weren't discussing these type of things in Canada. Um, the, the fact is that people are seeing these issues and they're saying, this isn't something that I would want to see myself go through. I wouldn't want to see my children go through and things need to change. And usually we will see some type of uh, groundswell in the public with respect to these type of issues, but they only last for a couple of weeks or a month. This has been something that has continued on for a period a significant period of time with people all across Canada saying this needs to end and enough is enough. And so in my world, I've been seeing that people are going to protest, people are sharing articles on Facebook and they're doing what they can. And they're also willing to engage, they're willing to listen, and they're willing to have that conversation, which I think is so important. Yeah, because I'm thinking that we, we seem to, you know, as you mentioned, you, you get a, a suddenly a great surge of interest in the problem and people wanting to, you know, do something about it in concern. And then, you know, a few months later, it's died down and it's back to normal that, uh, you know, systemic discrimination and racism, you know, continues. Like, uh, I, I think you probably will have noticed in, in, in the media, the number of Asian people who've come under all kinds of, uh, you know, attacks and uh, comments. And do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think right now, throughout this pandemic, we're seeing people who are being who are having their rights abused in the sense of with this pandemic, people are especially in the United States, where you have a president who is um, using very divisive language with respect to where the pandemic came from and the people who it should be associated to. This pandemic didn't exist uh, years ago. It's something new, and you can't blame certain groups or people because of it. And it's and it's disheartening to see that um, uh, Asian Canadians, for example, are being spit on in public. They are having signs that are put up that are, are disrespectful and and show uh, a certain type of malice to uh, and the sense of those people who are Canadian. And these are people who were born and raised in this country as well and, and want to see what's best for this country go ahead. And so it's disappointing to see that in the Asian community and also within our Indigenous community. I'm sure you'll recall just a few weeks ago or about a month or so where we had healthcare practitioners who were placing bets on the alcohol contact levels of Indigenous people. So anyone who's saying that uh, there is no systemic racism that exists in Canada just needs to look in the mirror. But then again, we can look to our own leadership in Canada where the premiers of our country could not even make a statement to say that there was systemic racism in our country, despite the long list that Canada has from the Starlight Tours to the issues that arose with Viola Desmond. How about you, Mark Hill? Have you come across any you know, kind of stories, experiences where you work? Because you're closer to, the, to people in the streets, it seems to me, certainly more closer than I am. And I just wondered... <laughs> Have you seen this problem of people being discriminated against because of what they look like and, you know, who they are? Um, myself, um, I've seen, I've witnessed discrimination, um, but not so overtly. Um, most of the people that I associate with aren't outwardly racist. 
Um, I've been on some of the receiving end of some racism, but I've been picking up more so from the news, actually, um, what's been going on. Uh, I haven't witnessed any incidences of racism in the past little while. You think you, you mentioned the news that that from my perspective, I notice that um, the the news the news seems to be reporting incidents more frequently than I've ever heard in my entire mm -hmm. life. You know, like it would be a non-story in the past, and it would never make it onto the air or onto the pages of a newspaper. It wasn't considered, uh, you know, serious enough or important enough to do that. I think I think that kind of thing might lead to uh, people, the politicians, you know, because you were mentioning politicians, George, that taking an interest, a little deeper interest in how life is being affected at the, the grassroots level and take action. I don't know. What do you think of that thought? Well, in, in my my view, there's people, there's corporations, there's politicians who are taking an opportunistic moment and saying, oh, well, I'm going to go and take a knee. Justin Trudeau did this about mm -hmm. a month ago. If we all remember about October of last year, um, when we had our election, we found out that our prime minister has worn brown and black face more than at least four times. So how can, how can you believe, like, actions... <laughs> Actions mean a lot, not just the symbolism of it. Uh, we have Colin, um, uh, Colin Kaepernick, who was taking a knee, and people said, I'm no longer going to watch, watch this sport anymore. Because, But now we have people going and taking knees, but they're not actually taking the steps to address those issues. So until there's actually concrete measures that will make and address the systemic issues that exist in society better, we cannot symbolic gestures will not do very, very much. They're a start, but we need to do more. And, and Mark Hill, what, what do you think uh, would be something that could be done at the community level that would get the people who make decisions take action to correct some of the problems, of the systemic problems for sure? Well, I, I, that's a really tough question because I feel that at the grassroots level, people have been advocating on these issues for decades. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, accountability structures aren't so much embedded into our government as we've seen with some ethics issues, et cetera, is a lot of the time um, governments just have to apologize and they don't actually have to take steps towards correcting their actions. So I think that really it comes down to finding young leaders um, like George <laughs> and electing them and making sure that we take power right there and that we can actually have voices at the table that are going to stand up to racism and ensure that new policies coming forward are actively anti-racist. Um, until everything is examined with that um, anti-racist lens, we're always going to be slipping through the cracks. Um, for example, people have been advocating for a Canadian black history curriculum from well before I was alive. Um, mm -hmm. And recently there has been a new provincial curriculum developed. Uh, and I believe it's been rolled out just over the last couple of years. And um, one of the hesitancies that I've heard to um, amending that um, curriculum is that it's brand new, uh, but it's not our fault that it's brand new and that black folks got left out again, right? It, it, so we have to make sure that we have people in the process that are saying, hold on a second, what about me, right? <laughs> Why am I not being reflected in this? Because my history is the province's history, and it's important that people understand that so that they can start to garner respect towards diverse voices and, and people in positions of power. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we, we have to be a little more assertive and aggressive in knocking on the doors of the decision makers and, and letting them know this is what we want. And, and we want it now, not 10 years down the road. What do you have to say, George? Yeah, well, thank you for that. I was just going to interrupt because I, I, I did want to join in on this conversation. And uh, for too often, I've said it's those who are in marginalized groups who have to set the table for these conversations. And it really shouldn't be that. Uh, 
It shouldn't mm -hmm. be the case in that circumstance. The people who do sit in these positions of power, they should be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations, like having a discussion about uh, racism, uh, gender, the, the way that people are treated in the workplace. It shouldn't be left to uh, Indigenous people to say, oh, well, you know what, I'm the one who's having my rights uh, uh, encroached upon, so let me set the table so everyone else can have a conversation about it. The people who actually have the ability to change things should be willing to say, you know what, this, this is uncomfortable, but I'm willing to hear your story because it's important. And the only way we're ever going to be able to make things better is if I hear what you say so that we can address what you, you have that, that's actually uh, causing struggles in your life. And then we can move forward with creating a better, uh, better way forward. Yeah, you know, sometimes I think the uh, the, the political uh, leaders don't think of uh, things that they do and how they affect people. And I, I give you a small point that uh, it's been a bugbear of mine for the last couple of years. The um, so, suddenly I woke up one morning and and this, I heard the news and they were talking about a traffic jam on the Massey Tunnel. Well. I didn't know where the hell the Massey Tunnel was, because when I went to sleep, I was sure it was the Dees Tunnel. And as you may know, John Sullivan Dees was a black man who was a very important person within British Columbia. He was a uh, uh, he had a fishing company, you know, fishing com canning company, and it was very important economically. But because he was so successful, many of the, the white people at the time. Uh, got him drummed out of British Columbia and, you know, et cetera, anyhow. But they did have this tunnel named after an important black person in, in B.C. history. But without consultation with anybody, one day I woke up and it was called the Massey Tunnel. But so I, I only make this point because the people who make decisions don't seem to care about the individuals the, the, in, you know, the, in, on the street. Uh, to get their opinion, do they want to change or, or, or do they want to participate in? Anyhow, th that's my sort of beat for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, not not to, to beat people up too much, but I do think there are definitely people who care. And I think that's something we, we do need to remember as well, that a lot of the changes that have occurred over decades is because people have gone on the streets and they've protested. They've said that things can't be this way. And there are elected officials who have have taken up the mantle to ensure that people's rights are protected. And it's, it is unfortunate. I can tell you, I was not aware of, of that story at all. Um, that, that is something completely new to me. The same way in which I've spoken to people about the Starlight Tours in Saskatchewan, and that many people were unaware that uh, police officers in Saskatoon were driving Indigenous people <laughs> 100 kilometers outside of their, their communities and dropping them off in negative 40 degree weather and saying, walk home. Would that happen to someone who wasn't Indigenous? I don't think so. The same way that we had uh, a white man go on to the prime minister's residence and mm -hmm. attempt, to, attempt to kill our prime minister, they arrested him peacefully. But yet, in other circumstances, when it's a person of color, it, that same type of treatment isn't afforded. And that's where I think this the central issue is. And, yeah, no, I, and I happen to agree with you. I think that we, we have to be a little more sensitive. You know, when we're, we're talking about uh, sort of race relations in Canada, we, we don't have such a, a great record that we might like to think we did, you know, because we talk about we the south of the border is where everybody thinks that slavery took place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and it didn't happen north of the border. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I ask you, I'll ask you both of you, Mark, what, what do you think about uh, race relations? Well, if you had to give it a grade in Canada, like a race relations, how, what, what kind of grade would you give it? And, and why would you give it that grade? <laughs> I can... <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> right? I like to ask tough questions. Yeah, right? no, thank you for that question. I believe race relations in Canada, as far as a letter grade goes, it would have to be on the the failing end. I, 
I'd have to give it a fail. Um, and I know that that goes against the story that we've been told most of our time. But I think reflecting on um, our, our race relations from the onset of Canada and um, the hundreds of years before Confederation as well, um, race relations haven't actually been a relationship. It's been more of a dominance um, more of a division um, and more suppression of um, BIPOC individuals, especially Indigenous peoples and Black people as well in Canada. 200 years of slavery, um, however many years of um, residential schools and the clearing of the plains and just absolutely horrible treatment um, of individuals. And to date, now, something that you both brought up um, was this erasure of our history. Paul, I'm so happy that you brought up that um, story of the tunnel, of the Massey Tunnel and the Dees Tunnel, because this is a perfect example of um, what Canada does, is we actually don't talk about those relationships that had been formed for so long, whether it's um, Africville, whether it's... Um, the fact that the first governor of BC was of African descent and married an indigenous woman. Um, we don't talk about these things. And I, it might be in an effort to reestablish that power cycle, but until leaders come to the fore who, and they don't necessarily have to be from those communities like George was saying, but until we have passionate leaders who are going to stand up and take an actively anti-racist approach to governing and to educating um, citizens, we can't say that it's a pass because I'm, I grew up in Canada and I know nothing about Canadian relationships with my peoples. How about you, George? Do you got any thoughts on that question? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if there's a grade that I could give that would adequately reflect the reflect the race relations in Canada just because of the issues that do exist. I think on the outset, if we're going to do the compliment sandwich, we have a, a, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has protected many people's rights and has elevated individuals who may not have had in, um, rights with, with their interactions in government. But then at the same time, we see racist pieces of legislation in the sense of the Indian Act, for example. Mm -hmm. then we can say, well, we have a prime minister who's doing his best to apologize for these type of things. But then at the same time, we have people who are being elected, elected and saying things that are just so unconscionable to what we, at least what I think Canada is supposed to be. Even recently, I was looking at the newspaper and there was a, a gentleman who was just reinstated into the Royal Canadian Navy after posting many, many articles on a racist platform um, saying that the only reason he joined the military was in order to be ready for a race war. And yet the Canadian government said, this is the type of person who deserves a second chance. But did Miss uh, Regis Korchinski Paquette get a second chance? No. Did um, Shannon Blanchard in Nanaimo, who uh, the police came to her home at a, a mental health check and uh, she ended up having a broken bone, a chipped tooth. Did she get a second chance? No. So it's interesting the different, um, the different uh, platforms or levels in which we'll consider uh, who gets a pass and who doesn't. So does Canada get a pass? Probably not. <laughs> and no, I, I, it's funny that I, I, I'm glad to hear both of your comments and what grade because because I, I I wouldn't even put it on the you know on the paper I mean as far as I'm concerned yeah. they, you know, yeah I couldn't even start with d minus if that's the way they you know they they mark them and I, and I think it's important and uh, and and I'm sort of an old codger about these things I got to tell you a, a bugbear and, and uh, for years but I, I one what I I really think that um, I'd like to get an idea from both of you about what you think we can do. I mean, even as individuals, what an individuals can do and then what collectively the circles we move in 
might be able to be motivated to do something about um, about the, you know race relations. Uh, let me. I'll start with you this time, George, and give Mark Keel an opportunity to <laughs> sort of stew his thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think one of the first things that we need to do is be willing to listen to people's stories. Um, there are too many people who often are speaking to. Uh, issues, whether it's, um, again, with the LGBTQ movement, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and people say, yeah, but that doesn't happen that often. They, they diminish it. And so I'd say the first thing that needs to happen is that we're, we're willing to sit down and have that conversation. The next, number two, I think that corporations and institution workplaces need to be able to have those difficult conversations and look at their their practices within their workplace. Um, again, as I mentioned, I, I, I work in law and I was in Toronto before I came to British Columbia. And even in the legal system, you would think that lawyers who were there to protect the rights of every single person in society, yet were unable to pass a, 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 a sheet that said a statement of principles that we will not treat people unfairly. We will not treat people in a way that uh, discriminates against them because of their ethnic background. That's another thing. I, I hate when people say, oh, uh, different races, because there's only one human, <laughs> there's one race and it's the human race. We just have different levels of melanin in our skin. <laughs> On top of that, it's, it's uh, education as well. And that starting and saying, going into the schools and saying, you know what, people look dif are, are different. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Other like there, there's a point zero 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 nine eight percent difference between all of us on this call right now, and the same with someone who's white of Asian descent, uh, wherever they are. And so I think we need to listen to people. We need to have governments step up. We need businesses to step up and say we're willing to start to allow for those changes to occur. We also need to look at our our institutions and saying that, oh, you know what? There can be such things as black doctors. There can be such things as uh, Asian doctors and, and lawyers. Like, again, you'll, you'll know quite well that um, I went to Osgoode Hall Law School, and that was the school where uh, Jewish people would go because they couldn't get into law school. So we need to look to the way that we frame things currently in our country and say, we're, we're going to take steps. And that's active steps, not just taking a knee but actually putting in legislative changes to say, this can't continue on the way that it does. Okay, great. Yeah, so you're up to bat, Mark Keel. <laughs> well, George just hit it out of the park, so I don't have too much <laughs> You're to too add. kind. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that taking um, action where you, you can within your workplace, within your community, within your family, whether it's a conversation, whether it's um, at, a, at a meeting, at a union meeting or something like that, but actually being vocal in, in your efforts to make changes and, and to identify those systemic barriers that might be holding other people back and to actively work towards um, improving them. George mentioned the, um, Charter of, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms earlier. And something that really bothers me about that charter is that there's a notwithstanding clause, right? So we're saying actually um, ethics and rights, they're optional. And that's a huge problem. At no point should our ethics and our human rights be debatable or be, have an opportunity to be diminished. So it's important that um, if you're in government, if you're a politician, that you're actively looking for those types of barriers. Oh, it doesn't seem like um, new members of political engagement can even communicate with us. Why is that, et cetera. Um, but other than that, I'd say um, really getting active in, in community involvement. Um, I think that so much of the time we want to go on and, and enjoy as though it's just us, but I think if, even if you could sacrifice four hours a month towards some kind of change, that it would make a, a huge difference. Yeah, if, if I might. 
Sorry, oh, go ahead. George. I was just going to say that I, I agree with everything that Mark Hill said, and I think that those community dialogues are just so important, and especially standing up in these type of moments because it's much easier to say we're going to leave it for somebody else to do. Um, it's We have an individual responsibility mm -hmm. amongst all of us, and Martin Luther King once said it, injustice um, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I think that's it's up to all of us. It's not just up to politicians. It's up to um, our parents, our sisters, or brothers. It's up to everyone to say, when I see something that's wrong, I'm actually going to stand up and, and comment on it rather than just idly stand by. Yeah, and sorry, if I could add on to that sure. thought as well, is um, if you're struggling to make those changes, to ask for help. Um, and I'm thinking specifically to education. Um, since I started looking into developing and, and implementing a Canadian Black History section of the curriculum, um, or for it to just be ingrained throughout, there's been lots of conversations about um, anxieties or fears from teachers about even just being able to have that conversation like George mentioned hey we, we're all the human race and we're going to talk about this and for myself that's a welcome conversation but for a lot of teachers and a lot of I think just normal citizens not just teachers themselves but everybody having those conversations it kind of goes back to the the way Canada always has been what do you mean there's different races it's a mosaic. We're all here together, right? So we've crafted this um, story that doesn't fit with our logic and the world that we see around us. And if I, sorry, I, I'm going to add on to what you said as well. And I think when you talk about that story, like we can look at our constitution and that's the master story of our, of our country. But who was involved in creating that story? Were Indigenous people part of that story? Were Asian Canadians part of that story, were Black Canadians part of that story? I don't think so. And so it's important that when we talk about these type of things, we also look at who is involved in that as well. Yeah, I should tell you that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the notwithstanding, you know, clause in the, in the Constitution. The, uh, I, I protested against that vigorously, you know, uh, thinking because it's like saying, um, everybody's got equal rights, but we're going to be able to take your rights away from you if it's if it's blocking what we might want to do in our society. You know that, uh, and you and your your people think that it's not the best for them. So it, it's the kind of thing you know because it touches on what you've touched on, George, and you, Markeel, about there there are political decisions that are taken and made, and and you sometimes look at it and you say. How could what were they thinking? How could they have been thinking like that? And why were they thinking like that? And and um, and when I'm in my um, talking to myself mood and I've got nobody, I, I say, I wonder how much money they're getting to make that decision, you know. Uh, but I can't say that out out loud because I <laughs> could be accused of being biased, you know. And I'm not, or prejudiced even. But I'm I'm the, the most equal person you'll ever run into in your life, and you yeah. heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, going back to that um, notwithstanding clauses, it could potentially even just change the way that we think. Um, if I'm, you know, let's look at Bill 21 um, in Quebec, is we're going to do this and what we're going to have to do to put it through is to, is not use the not, is, is to implement the notwithstanding clause. So now there, the logic is I have the right to do this. Mm -hmm. I have the right to do this because I say so, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so that that garners a sense of entitlement to the dominant class because that bill disproportionately affects um, marginalized peoples. Um, whereas if there was no notwithstanding clause, just learning that in school, then you say, you're right. We're all human and we all deserve respect all the time. Yeah, because as you may know that during the last uh, one of the provincial elections in Ontario, um, uh, Premier Ford tried, to, you know, threatened to invoke the notwithstanding clause so he could 
you know, do something he wanted to do with his government, regardless of the protest, you know. And uh, and I think it's a dangerous clause, and uh, it needs to be maybe more thorough discussion than we're than what we're having here. But the fact that it exists and we know what it does when it's you know uh, implemented means that. It's not a fair system when a group can just invoke that and say, we don't care what you think or how it affects you. We're going to do it anyhow. Yeah. And so, if I may, sorry, yes. um, in, the, in the last federal election, I don't want to get stuck on this issue, but yes. nobody came out outwardly against it. Nobody championed, no, not one person running for prime minister went in and said, if I'm prime minister, you're right. If that gets to the federal level, we will try and get rid of bills, uh, Bill 21. Everybody was so afraid of the political consequences because the, the, the thought of the people has been pushed so far because of um, one, one thing, the notwithstanding clause, to all of these people now think, this is my right and I'm going to affect your, your job and, and your government's ability. Well, and it's interesting, especially on this this topic with respect to face coverings and so on. We're now in the midst of a pandemic, and yet there's no issues with respect to whether or not anyone is wearing a face covering. And that's where I think you, it's important from a legal standpoint, especially with respect to human rights. How could we have achieved what the government wanted to? Um, there needs to be a rationale that that is tied to a purpose that makes sense. And the fact is... Could you could someone not give the oath to Canada in front of a, a let's say it's a woman who doesn't feel comfortable in front of another male? Could she not go into a room with that other female and perhaps take off the mat, um, take off the burqa and speak with um, speak with the representative and give the oath? Were there not other alternatives? Interestingly, when you go deep down into issues like this, you'll find that people aren't necessarily upset about religious symbols, for example. Um, Elizabeth, May, Elizabeth May regularly wears a, a cross around your neck, um, but yet no one has a problem with that. But um, the leader of the NDP, uh, Jagmeet Singh, has, uh, has a turban on and people are walking through Quebec and they say, oh, I really wish he just wouldn't wear the turban. Like, it, it, it's just too much. It's like, well, what about the other issues? So, and, and then you have the Premier of Quebec saying, there's no systemic racism in our province. <laughs> Some people are blind. It was that, you know, so blind, they're so blind they can't see, right? And uh, can't hear either. It seems to have an effect on, on uh, hearing and sight organs. Well, it's but, much easier uh, to ignore these issues than to confront them. Uh, they're, they're not comfortable conversations. And in Canada, as Mark Hill has said, like these are the type of things that we tend to push to the side or we diminish when we look to what happens in the United States and tell people, well, you could have it much worse, so be happy with what you have. I think you're right, because uh, what people don't know and, 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 uh, about the history of Canada, and because we, we never get it taught in its uh, full you know, sense, because there, there were... Um, speeches in, in the House at the time when, uh, you know, the, Canada was offering territory to new people coming into the country, you know, mm -hmm. inviting them from the United States to come in. There were politicians who stood up in the House and didn't want to sell the land to the black farmers who wanted to come north. You know, they they say, oh no, they, they can't, they won't be able to stand the cold. They, they you know, they won't mm -hmm. understand how to do this. And, 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 they, and it was specific. You, you look at the Hansards in the house and then you see this argument where they didn't want black people to cross the border and get these free lands that they were being offered to the white people coming across the border. So, um, this is why when I think about, um, you know, race relations in Canada, we, we seem to have them under a cloak and, and we only open up part of the cloak from time to time and say, look, we're pretty good guys. And then we go back down and, uh, you know, there's the, the discrimination takes place. Well, and I don't understand it. Maybe the two of you might have a, a perspective on this. Like, I don't understand 
why the teaching of black history is 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 such a problem in this country. It, it I mean, it can't hurt anybody. <laughs> well, and people have been trying for a while. Uh, uh, it was um, Member of Parliament Jean Augustine who brought in Black History Month to Canada in the ninth with uh, Jean Chrétien. Uh, mm-hmm. It took that long to even have that the ability to have Black History Month. So these things, unfortunately, take a lot of time, and it take. And that's why people need to consistently be in, need to consistently be engaged and involved in order to allow for the advancement of everyone's rights. Not just to say, well, you know what, this isn't my fight right now, or I'm willing to go and change my Facebook photo to black for 24 hours. It means that I'm actually going to do what I can to change my behavior and also have that conversation and listen to people when they, when they say that these issues do exist. How about you, Mark? Heal any thoughts on that? Um, definitely. I think some something that like a theme that's kind of coming up. You were saying why, like, what's the threat in teaching um, Canadian Black history? And I think it comes back to that formative time in Canada, and when um, Black settlers started coming up into Canada. We have a rich history here of, of people in power, of people in politics like in the 19th century um however they were on the receiving end of so much um discrimination many of them opted to move back to the states um so we've lost our staying power we've lost our communities um and and we need to bring all that back and 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 it may just be the fact that power tries to maintain itself and reproduce itself. And this has been the way that they've done it is by not even letting people know uh, what our real history is. And it's it's a much richer history than the one that we were all taught. And it, it's really a disservice to all Canadians for us to not be aware of um, what this nation really came out of and what it can grow into, because there's so much potential here. There is a lot of potential, I agree. And I, I think one of the other things is, that's extremely important is that in order for us to move forward and not repeat those actions, we need to learn from the history that exists because mm-hmm. it's easy to paint over things and to forget that they're there, but they, they need to be taught in order to in order for people to know that this is what's happened and we shouldn't be erasing anyone's story. You know, there, there was a, I don't know if you're familiar with John Ware, uh, and he's a black uh, rancher who, who brought a ton of no. cattle up from, I think it was Oklahoma, but I, 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 I could be checked on that point. But he settled in Alberta and he brought, you know, his cattle there and, and raised them. And uh, he was quite the the person in, in Alberta during his lifetime. He unfortunately had an unfortunate death when he had an accident with one of his horses, I think fell on him or something. But but in the southern Alberta, there's there's a John Ware Museum. And so at least the people in Alberta have recognized that John Ware, a black rancher, you know, who who obviously his his uh, horse ranch and whatnot uh, brought economy into the situation. And and the people, at least somebody in Alberta has has thought he was important enough to create a museum which reflects his his, his uh, life in, in the country. And those type of stories, I agree that like we need to have more of those. Even uh, you probably recall, and well, we we know because we can now look, look at our ten dollar bill that has Viola Desmond on it. But essentially, she was Canada's own Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks, actually. Yeah. And disappointingly, when they were talking about putting her on the ten dollar bill, the response from Canadians saying. How dare you put this person on the $10 bill? Like, it's shocking. But it's a part of our history, and so it's important. She did receive a post-posthumous pardon for not giving up her seat in the movie theater in Nova Scotia. A good good step, but we need to do more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. right. And I think, like you were saying, um, we, we need to do more to reconcile when there's been... Um, gross atrocities made or incidences of racism, and there has to be uh, clear ways to deal with um, acts of racism that are holistic, that can benefit the whole 
community that's being affected or all are all people involved and um viola desmond was one person um to get kicked out of the movie theater but i believe she wasn't the first right and and uh, things like this and john ware an incredible story i know dr Fu cooper out of nova scotia um she has some phenomenal poetry on that um but all of these things it like it's it's just so rich and nice to learn um but yeah sorry that's all yeah, i got no, no, but you know you made me think because in nova scotia when I, when i worked down there um, and I, 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 I'm embarrassed. I, I can't remember the name of the Victoria Cross uh, winner. You know, um, you know, and I, I anyhow, I, a quick story. We, we had a black uh, history display in Nova Scotia. And one of the things that we were able to do was get the Victoria Cross, his, his Victoria Cross. Because, as you know, those things were awarded to people who military anyhow that uh, did tremendous things in battle, and and uh, so anyhow, his 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 um, medals got stolen off his his casket in his funeral. Ended up in England, and the nice thing about it, the province of British, uh, brother sort of Nova Scotia, bought them back, and so and they were kept in the Parliament buildings in in Halifax. So when we were having this Black History Month display. I convinced the provincial government to loan us the uh, Victoria Cross and we had them on display so people could see them. And then, of course, the story around uh, them was was there. But but I got to tell you that the night that I the, the day I picked up the, the Victoria Cross and went home with them and was getting them ready to put on display the next day. I didn't have much sleep that night because I was sure somebody was going to come in and steal them from me. But <laughs> but the fact that he was a, a Victoria Cross winner, one of the first, you know, and uh, I, I feel embarrassed not remembering his name, you know. Uh, uh, now I'm going to have to go look it up. <laughs> well, I think that's a great opportunity for everyone who ends up watching this to actually take the yeah. time to go and look it up as well. You know, because... The, Sorry, the nation Martha. shares that embarrassment with you, Paul, <laughs> is that this is the type of thing that we ought to all know. Yeah. Uh, and, and that we're just not taught. I feel the same way. I didn't know that Harry Jerome was of African descent until a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, and I think Harry Jerome broke six different world records uh, in various different sports. And like yeah. a Canadian held sprint world records multiple <laughs> times and all these yeah. different things. No, and you're you're right, and and they're important stories. They're positive stories, you know. That you can say, look, it, these were people who were right in the middle of society, and and participated in it, and didn't do, you know, anything. But his family, Harry's family, was discriminated against yes. when they arrived, and you know, because he and I went to high school together. We were we were we were good lifetime friends, and um, but. You know, it's it's the kind of thing that in our society we don't push enough because somebody says, well, you know, uh, don't make waves. If you make waves, you know, you know, people aren't going to allow you to uh, get into a, a higher position in life. You know, we can s sort of stunt your growth there and uh, then you end up not accomplishing or achieving the what you should, you know, I think democratically achieve in life. Um, I mean, uh, and one other little story I wanted to just tell, because uh, Halifax reminded me of it. Uh, at the time, uh, the, the society, the police, the, at least the police society, considered me and the, what was the, called the Black United Front uh, were dangerous agitators. You know, we were dangerous agitators. And so anyhow, one day I had a note to go visit the uh, chief of police in the city. And so I, I went to see him and he, he looked at me and he said, look at, uh, you know, there's been a discussion and, uh, you know, if you don't quit doing the things that you're doing, you're going to be deported. And I, I looked at him and I said, you do what you have to do and I'll do what I have to do. But in the back of my mind, I thought, how can they deport me to Toronto, where I was born? 
you know, like his his automatic assumption was I was an agitating black man. I must be American, you know, mm-hmm. like because it's, uh, you Canadians, you know, we're we're kind of quiet and polite. Anyhow, I don't know. Maybe well, what's your thought on that, Canadians? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark Hill, if you want to go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, my thought on that is the origin story that I uh, that I've heard of uh, CSIS, Canada's spy agency. I'm sure you know about this, Paul. Uh, <laughs> And I'm sure that you could actually help me with the story because there was a sit-in when in 1968 or something at a in a dean's office mm-hmm. back east yes. um, by uh, black students, and I've read that out of that came Canada's spy agency, like the, <laughs> that the government was so worried about black agitators that this is that we had to develop the the CIA basically for Canada. <laughs> Um, which really talks about, uh, or, or which really speaks to that um, example that you used of rocking the boat. Mm. I myself has experienced that. Is like I'm new to organizing and everything, and, and I say what I mean, and I try and do it in a cordial way. But I mean, it, it is far from fun, <laughs> far from fun um, all the time because it does bring you those criticisms. But um, hopefully, we can rock the boat in such a manner that. The momentum really starts to pick up those waves get the boat and we can flip it over and, and start anew or, or get close to that anyhow yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, I, I would agree I, I i've often been of the the belief that one needs to have quiet conversations with people over time to be able to uh, change the minds and hearts of people but I've watched too much go on now that I can't continue to sit quietly. Um, I, if it wasn't for people like yourself, uh, Martin Luther King, Aretha Franklin, um, uh, Jean Augustine, all of these people who, uh, John Lewis, for example, who stood up and said, "We, I, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today. Uh, I, I, before my sister, like there were no no other lawyers in my family. I I had never met a black black lawyer before. Uh, again, like these type of things should, it, there should be equal opportunity and rights for everyone. And that's one of the sad things about um, the perspective that people have taken with respect to Black Lives Matter and their responses, all lives matter. It's not the opposite of Black Lives Matter is Black Lives Don't Matter. It's a simple grammatical Mm-hmm. piece of, of English that people should understand. There's a group of people that are saying, I'm suffering, I'm hurting, I'm in pain, and I want, I also should be considered. And that's that's something that I find extremely disappointing that people are saying that all lives matter. I don't go to someone's birthday and say, oh, well, it's your birthday, happy birthday. Well, everyone's birthday matters, so yours isn't very important. <laughs> and yeah. so that's the type of approach that I think we need to start uh, taking into account is that it's, it, I'm not going to sit by and say, I'm, I'm going to try and make you comfortable when you are doing are creating behaviors or um, taking actions that make other people feel unsafe, unheard, and, and that they don't belong. Yeah, well, we only have about... I guess about three minutes now. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say just in the, the closing? Anything that comes to your mind that uh, we, uh, are we gonna, you can encourage people to do things if you want? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd encourage people to visit the BC Community Alliance's website and um, sign on to our petition. But I'd also encourage folks to really um, take that accountability mechanism and vote for people who are proactively working towards um, ending systemic racism. And if you can't find those people on the ballot or in a party, contact them and demand it of them because I can assure you those conversations are happening somewhere and it's going to take more pressure from within those organizations and from the outside. So really um, use this time in COVID where we're staying at home to engage in your civil society and help improve it. Yeah. I, I would echo all of the comments that uh, Mark Hill has made. Uh, people should take the time, especially during this time where we have a lot of time indoors, uh, to be able to go and look into some of the. There's a few names that were mentioned during uh, this um, this discussion. 
I, I encourage people to go and research some of these names, to research some of the topics that we've discussed, to inform them. And also, if they happen to be in a situation where someone is bringing up the issues that they face on a daily basis, um, that they take the opportunity to actually listen to them and say, I want to learn more about what you have to say. And so those would be the types of things that I would encourage people who've taken the time today to listen to this uh, discussion. Yeah, no, that's, and and I, I agree with you. I think that we, we are, have a number of people who uh, have entered into political life, you know, and, and are, are putting their names forward to be, uh, you know, elected officials. And I'm sure there are people of color that I, that I know are out there have done that. And they're going to be bringing their story and hopefully the fact that they're inside the system might might uh, bring us faster results. Uh, you know, I, I can't think of anything better than equality, but uh, I just like to see it happen quickly. But uh, I, I'd like to just thank the both of you. You know, we, we got about 30 seconds left, uh, but I wanted to thank both of you for participating. And um, uh, I hope we can maybe do this again, you know, and, and uh, just down the road a bit. And uh, I, w I wouldn't mind having a, a number of um, women participate in this discussion as well, because I know that there's a different perspective, uh, although they may share the same color, they, they do have uh, uh, some things that are effective differently than it affects men. So yes. anyhow, but I'd like to thank you for this. Uh, thank you, Paul, and also thanks to Shaw for uh, giving the opportunity to host this discussion. Yes, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Shaw. Uh, Paul, this is a, a huge honor to be able to share space with you, um, oh, especially, so you. yeah, especially here on what will be television. That's really special <laughs> for me. I'll hold on to that for a long time. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you very much. I appreciate that. And it was a pleasure to meet you as well, Markel. Yes, very nice to meet you yeah. too, George. Yeah.